now I'm recording. Uh, York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. And in, in fact, the area known as Tikaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wandat, and the Metis. In fact, this land is now home to many different Indigenous peoples. We also want to acknowledge the current treaty holders, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampan Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. So I want all of you to take a moment to think about where you are coming from, where you're joining in at, and who has been the caretakers of your land. Um, who are your current neighbors? Who are your neighbors in the past? And this is a really neat website. It's www.native-land.ca. It was initially designed as a Canadian resource, but it is now global. So you can zoom into the area that you're currently located in or areas perhaps your research has occurred or you've got specimens from and see who are the Indigenous peoples in those areas past and present. And I really encourage you with reconciliation um, to really think about what your impact on the land is and how you can you know, expand your own knowledge and relationships with the Indigenous peoples. So we're going to turn things over to Dr. Packer right now and let him continue on um, with some discussions and uh, introduction to today, to today. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, uh, wherever you are. We have people, as usual, from pretty much all over the world. Um, we're going to dedicate today's uh, session to the memory of Fernando Amaral da Silva, who, as I think most of you probably know, passed away relatively recently at the young age of 62. I, he, uh, he was one of my favorite melatologists, if not the favorite. I was lucky enough to spend several days with him uh, after the meeting. Um, the image at the bottom in the middle there is one that was taken while he was visiting Toronto. And uh, he stayed at my house for a couple of times. And he was the most, in, you know, just a marvelous, enjoyable person to spend time with. So I think we're all going to miss him pretty badly. Um, okay, so today's uh, talks are on longhorn bees. First of all, we're going to have Felipe Freitas. Uh, Felipe is, has a master's degree in zoology from the Universidad Federal de Minas Gerais and a doctorate degree in entomology from the Universidad de Sao Paulo. Uh, he is now a postdoctoral uh, researcher at Washington State University working on bee phylogenomics, biogeography and macroevolution as a whole. He has been working on bee phylogenetics and taxonomy for more than 10 years and is deeply interested in hard phylogenetic problems. I'm really glad somebody is interested in those and historical biogeography. Um, the second speaker will be Dr. Achik Dorchin. Um, his main interests are taxonomy, systematics and flora associations of several groups of bees, particularly longhorn bees and leaf cutter bees and, uh, and dauber bees to the genus Megachylae. He uses both morphological and molecular approaches. He had a master's degree at the School of Zoology in Tel Aviv University, did his PhD at the University of Haifa. Uh, his postdoctoral studies have been at Tel Aviv University uh, with Brian Danforth at Cornell, the USDAIRS Pollinating Insects Research Unit at Utah State University and the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, this was followed by work as a scientific collection manager of bees in the Steinhardt Museum of Natural History at Tel Aviv University. Since October 2021, he's been a research fellow at the Royal Museum for Central Africa in Tervuren and the University of Mons, both of which are in Belgium. So with no further ado, we'll go straight to Dr. Felipe Freitas. Thank you. And actually, as Felipe brings up his slides, I just want to point out to everyone that this is a webinar so that everyone is actually muted. But we do encourage you to add your questions to the Q&A function. So not to the chat box. Um, please try to add into the Q&A uh, feature so we can keep track of those a bit better going forwards. As well, we are scheduled for an hour, um, but we tend to run a bit long in our discussion sometimes. So please do not feel obligated to stay if you need to leave early. So we are scheduled to run until uh, noontime Eastern, um, but we do tend to go a bit later sometimes if we get into a really good discussion. So please feel free to leave at any time if you need to. And with that, I turn it on to, over to Felipe. Thank you, Victor. No problem, Felipe. 
thank you very much for your excellent talk. Um, um, Victoria, for how long shall I uh, talk, uh, please? Whatever you want to talk, you know, half hour or well, okay. about a half hour, 15, 20 minutes. Um, then you have a little bit, a few minutes for questions after that. Yeah, I think initially sort of half hour each, but. Um, yeah, okay. You don't want to rush it too much, but yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, so everybody who were uh, waiting to uh, see the uh, Userini result, uh, I think now we should be happy because we couldn't ask for a better work as has done uh, by Felipe uh, Freitas et al. And uh, so thank you very much, Felipe, for, your, uh, for, your, uh, for this talk. And I will um, move quickly. Um, to talk uh, on uh, one of the sub subtribes of Eucerini, uh, the subtribe Eucerina, and expand a bit about uh, and expand about the floral association and diversification uh, in this um, uh, clade of bees. Uh, this results. Uh, um, this study was performed when I was working in the uh, in National Natural History Collections in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and in the Steinhardt Museum of Natural History in Tel Aviv University in Israel. And um, the subtribe Eucerina was uh, previously referred to as the Eucera complex as already um, um, said, uh, which will result where uh, the uh, boundaries between uh, genera and subgenera were still unclear, and it was the last um, uh, of these groups to receive phylogenetic treatment. Also, uh, it includes exactly uh, half of the around 780 known species in the tribe Eucerini, so the largest uh, subtribe, and some uh, well-known species uh, such as the squash bees of North and South America, that most of you uh, should know. And here is uh, the tree that uh, we used in, the, in this uh, work. It is based on the Zanger sequencing, and it is mostly congruent, as said, uh, to the uh, tree by, uh, to the new tree uh, based on uh, UCEs, with some important exceptions. This uh, node here was unresolved in our study, but is supported in the UCE tree, and it leads uh, to uh, several lineages largely restricted to North America, with most of the species falling uh, uh, in the uh, uh, group first called Senoglossodes, and um, which uh, include mostly uh, the um, uh, smaller and um, uh, ordinary looking species uh, later delineated by uh, Michener as Tetraloniella in, in North America. And it's, uh, as said, it's still uh, problematic, still a paraphyletic group in respect to more uh, um, specialized um, uh, lineages with specialized morphologies such as Xenolosa Smith and uh, Centricolonia Leberg. And uh, in this uh, case, the classificatory decisions, as mentioned by Felipe, may be uh, somewhat subjective, but this is not always the case. Uh, for example, in Tetraloniella, the type species of Tetraloniella from the old world uh, and also that of Tetralonia are included in this tree. And you can see that they fall uh, together in the same clade, which means that the uh, uh, Tetraloniella is a junior synonym and this name should not be used any longer although unfortunately it still appears in some online databases. The second uh, exception uh, mentioned already by Felipe was uh, the name Cubitalia frise, uh, including uh, the small uh, group of two-celled uh, species uh, from the old world, the rest of them being in Eucera. In our phylogeny, it was uh, um, nested deeply within Eucera, but as shown, it is uh, recovered as sister to the rest of the two-celled species and uh, therefore can be recognized as um, a sister uh, to, uh, uh, as a subgenus to Eucera. 
So now I would just like to quickly take you back to the first, one of the first characteristics uh, recognized uh, in B classification, the uh, uh, length of the tongue or the mouth parts. And as you all know, we can uh, partition the bees into short and long, long tongue bees. Uh, but it is not really the absolute length uh, of the tongue which could change from species to species, uh, although indeed in long tongue uh, bees, uh, the tongue uh, would be uh, longer um, than in the short tongue bees, but more the structure, and especially if you can, uh, can see uh, the length of the labial pulp, uh, pulpal segments. So here, the two first pulpal segments are much longer than the rest, and in the uh, short and bees, it's normally uh, comparatively short. And um, uh, so uh, this uh, slide, I, I like this slide a lot, and uh, I think it's quite unique. And I uh, borrowed it from uh, Michael Terzo from uh, the University of Mons in Belgium, it shows uh, the um, um, it shows uh, the uh, frequency of, uh, of the visitation frequency of, uh, of bees to different uh, host plants and comparing short and long tongue bees based on uh, observations made in Belgium. And it shows quite clearly that uh, when looking at the short tongue bees, they tend to visit more frequently uh, bowel or, or uh, um, or a cup shaped flowers with a freely accessible pollen and nectar, uh, such as found in the plant families Asteraceae, uh, Rosaceae, uh, Apiaceae, Apiaceae, and others. And these flowers are uh, commonly visited by almost any uh, insect that, uh, that can uh, use the resources from these uh, flowers. In contrast, when looking on the long-term bees, they tend to visit uh, flowers uh, mostly in the uh, families uh, Lamiaceae, Fabaceae, and some in Boraginaceae, which have very different flowers in which uh, uh, the pollen and the nectar are uh, hidden and are restricted within the floral structure, which is uh, more complex. And, uh, and actually, uh, only or almost only bees uh, can uh, exploit uh, and collect uh, the uh, pollen from uh, these flowers. Uh, and therefore uh, they are uh, sometimes referred to in the literature as uh, bee flowers. So looking here at the uh, diagram uh, of this uh, flower from the Fabaceae, you can see uh, the anthers with the pollen and you can see that they are completely covered by the petal leaves so the approaching bee cannot see the pollen, and more so the nectars, uh, the nectaries or the nectar producing glands are at the base of the flower uh, hidden deep inside the floral tube and are inaccessible. So uh, when the bee uh, land on the flower, in this example is Megachyle erysotome, it has to push its head into the floral uh, uh, structure uh, very strong with a lot of force force, sorry, to open uh, the, um, this specialized structure and it uh, operates uh, the pollination mechanism. And it seems like this. In this case, in the Fabaceae, the anthers and also the style with the stigma uh, are in ventral position and uh, the pollen is uh, spread over the lower uh, region of the body of the bee. So uh, in this case, the plant really um, um, manipulates uh, the bee uh, to a specific uh, position in which it deposits uh, the, the pollen uh, to ensure um, uh, higher chances for uh, pollination in the next flower. So looking again at how it's done, you can see um, this pollination mechanism. In other uh, kinds of uh, other families, it could be a little, a bit different. Uh, so for example, in the Lamiaceae, the, both the hunters and uh, the stigma are in a dorsal position and they spread the pollen on uh, the dorsal part of, uh, of the bee, but uh, the idea is similar. So in this in mind, uh, looking back at the tree, we see a very interesting pattern of distribution, of floral host distribution of the bees in the Eucerina. 
where most uh, or almost all the uh, basal lineage or more early diverged lineages are associated with cup or bowl shaped flowers with freely accessible pollen and nectar uh, and radially symmetric flowers such as in Diasteraceae, Dipsacaceae, um, Malvaceae, Onagraceae, Convulvulaceae and, uh, and Cucurbitaceae. And only in the more uh, re uh, recently diverged uh, subgenera Sinhalonia and Eucera down here in pink and in red, we see uh, many lineages that are associated with, uh, uh, with bee flowers with a uh, uh, more complex structure and concealed uh, or hidden um, nectar and pollen, such as in uh, the uh, Lamiaceae, Fabaceae, and some Boraginaceae. But um, in order to accurately determine uh, the uh, pollen um, um, preference uh, of, of a bee species, uh, uh, pollen analysis are required. And that's what we have done here. You can see in the uh, column to the left of the phylogeny, the different pollen types. And on the branches, we further classified uh, the uh, pollen types into accessible pollen in black and restricted pollen in red. And indeed, you can see that most of the lineages uh, at the basal por portion of the tree are associated with accessible pollen. And many lineages in Sinalonia and Eucera down here <clears throat> are, um, are associated with a restricted or inaccessible uh, uh, pollen, um, sometimes uh, in combination with accessible pollen. So the most common hosts of accessible pollen in our data set were the Asteraceae in blue. Here you can see how the pollen grains uh, look like. The Cucurbitaceae in yellow, this is uh, these large pollen grains. The Malvaceae in uh, pink. And some others like uh, the Dipsacase. By far the most common hosts with restricted pollen in our data set were from the Fabaceae in red with different pollen types. But some others also uh, were from the Lamiaceae and even uh, the Ericaceae. Some lineages collected both accessible and restricted pollen, and we refer to them as polylactic in gray, although this is not really accurate definition. And finally, we also partitioned uh, the uh, data into ol oligolactic pollen specialist and polylactic pollen gener generalist species, which you can see here only uh, for the ancestral. Uh, uh, constructions, these uh, blue pie charts next to the nodes, they show that all the ancestors were oligolectic species, um, species. The other part of our work was uh, the di diversification rate analysis uh, using uh, state dependent speciation and extinction models, uh, which are parametric uh, and uh, model based methods. Um, and, um, and are very intensively and, um, and rapidly evolving field of study, becoming more and more specialized. But when properly performed, I, I think that uh, it is advantages uh, to uh, using other um, semi-parametric or non-parametric uh, models. We use maximum likelihood analysis in SEC SSE uh, with series of six models with two to four hidden states including full state dependent BZ and a model with extin extinction rates constrained to be equal. All the uh, results from this analysis showed uh, a greater net diversification rate for the uh, pollen restricted associated B lineages and the polylactic uh, B lineages. Then we also used Bayesian and CMC analysis in diversity tree in R with three pollen accessibility sets and a different um, ca uh, categorization of the polymorphic state. And here, uh, panels A, B, and C show that uh, regardless to the way the polymorphic states uh, were um, um, categorized, um, all the analysis, analysis supported uh, significant um, greater net diversification rates for the uh, restricted pollen associated bee lineages with these lines here uh, marking the no effect uh, value. And you can see that most of the samples are above this line. 
except maybe for this uh, model uh, with uh, the full busy model here, which showed the same pattern, but was only marginally significant. And except for panel D, where the data was partitioned not by floral uh, accessibility, but by uh, pollen uh, specificity, that is generalist ver versus specialist species. So this was not significant uh, in contrast to what we have found with maximum likelihood analysis. So to summarize the results from the study, um, we found uh, several floral host shifts of derived lineages in the subgenera Sinalonia and Usera to incorporate restricted pollen from structure, structurally complex bee flowers uh, compared to a diet based on accessible pollen in the uh, more basal lineages. This was found actually uh, and demonstrated in other studies, uh, although, uh, it was not mentioned in the, in the text, uh, for example, for the tribe of Kidini in the work of Muller from 1996, for the family Megachylidae um, as a whole in Litman et al. 2011, uh, and in uh, the two other Megachylidae genera, uh, Hoplitis and Osmia, as well as in Melita from the family Melitidae in the work of uh, Delico et al. Our analysis also indicate clear trend of increased diversification rate following the inclusion of restricted pollen, probably by opening an opportunity to exploit this vast food resource that was not accessible uh, to uh, other lineages. Where the largest group of inaccessible host plants uh, were from the Fabaceae, uh, so-called inverted repeats lacking clade which corresponds to the temperate herbaceous uh, Fabaceae, which radiated from tropical and subtropical regions into the temperate zone, and uh, which uh, largely um, parallel uh, the uh, current distribution uh, seen for uh, the relevant uh, genera Sinalonia and Usera, and can explain uh, their, uh, uh, both their distribution and radiation in uh, the northern parts uh, of the whole Arctic. Finally, uh, uh, also our results provide contrasting evidence uh, to the hypothesis, hypothesis that broadening of, uh, of pollen diet, uh, the transition from oligolecti to polylecti, increased diversification rate as described and shown in two studies in Littmann et al. 2011 and in Murray et al. 2018. And finally, our study provide a, a first empirical evidence to show that the, a floral host shift has driven increased diversification of the bee clay, and it complements uh, previous studies done with the flowering plants uh, to demonstrate the importance of plant pollinator interactions uh, for speciation. So um, thank you for, uh, for staying, hope that you uh, stayed, and uh, thanks every, uh, all all the researchers that were involved in the different uh, studies, including Anat Shafir, Itai Neroz, Daphna Langhut, Frank Newman, Nico Feriken, Margarita Lopez Uribe, Christophe Pra, Terry Griswold, and Brian Danforth. And thanks, uh, Nick, Nico, for your beautiful pictures that I used throughout this uh, presentation. And thank you also, Lawrence and Victoria, for inviting us and for uh, uh, having this uh, seminar series. Great, thank you very much, Eric, and apologies for having your rush there at the end. Um, mm -hmm. We will record the presentation, so you want to go back and look at any of the figures or slides. Uh, probably about two weeks, check back on our website, and we'll have it posted there. And now, if you have any questions, you can add them to the q and A. Uh, you don't have any questions there right now, but so take a moment now and add your question to the, the q and A box. Again, we appreciate you hanging out, and I'm sure there's lots of opportunity for discussion. And questions for Felipe or Eric um, are both welcome. Although I think we should, if possible, we should deal with the questions to Achik first for ease of editing. So if nobody else has one, I do. And and Achik, can so what do the botanists tell us about why it is that flowers evolve to have hidden pollen? So uh, most of the evidence comes from works uh, about uh, 
groups of plants with restricted pollen and nectar or with, uh, or, or with floral spars, uh, but they don't necessarily focus on bees. Uh, I am, most of the uh, studies that I found were actually uh, looking at, uh, at uh, birds, at hummingbirds that visit these uh, flowers and, and not much is known um, or can be explained and, and um, and uh, clearly, there are also other factors uh, that, that are involved in determining uh, the association or uh, the uh, possible uh, advantage of being or having a complex uh, flower, uh, stru uh, floral structure. The other part uh, that I did not include here, and is, which is discussed in our uh, paper that you can find, um, is other factors except for the physical structure of the plant. And this is the pollen chemistry that must have an, a, 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 a strong uh, influence on the, on the collection and use of the pollen. Uh, but this is a very broad subject that, uh, that, uh, that is, uh, was not, not presented or discussed in my talk. So, there, so the bottom line that, uh, there is still much to do in this uh, field of study, I think. Yeah, that's, that's true. I, I'm, I'm exposing my ignorance of the botanical side of bee plant interactions here quite well. Uh, are there any more questions? Yes, there's a question that's come up in the q and I will, I will read these out. Um, so this is from Nico. Getting back to the diversification paper, do you think that the tribe or genus taxonomic level is likely to exhibit similar results in other groups, for example, in short tongue bees. Um, Do you want me to repeat the question? Um, I'm not sure that I understood Nicole's question. Um, so, um, why would, um, is that um, with respect to, uh, to uh, restricted pollen, uh, uh, flowers of, with restricted pollen, or? Yeah. Okay, so Nico posted another uh, question. In other words, can we ex expect increases of diversification at the genus or tribe levels in other groups of bees? Uh, so I think, yes, I think, uh, I think that we should expect, but, uh, um, but because uh, the uh, floral uh, association between bees, uh, uh, the floral association of bees is a, a very labile lab uh, uh, characteristic and is changing uh, in different uh, taxa uh, in both directions uh, very uh, frequently during the, their evolution time. Uh, I think that we should uh, um, examine this specifically for each uh, for each taxon and each group of bees separately, and uh, look for uh, different possible drivers that might uh, drive this um, this um, 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 transitions between uh, different floral uh, preference preferences. Thank you. Uh, anybody else got any questions for Achik? It seems not. Okay, so let's let's go to pretty complicated. Um, Ruben Garrido has a question for Achik. Um, do you think that the BISSE analysis could use uh, a pollen character, for example, frequency visits to flowers? and the nature of the pollen together. Well, I guess there's a more statistical approach to the analysis. I don't know this BISSE method, so I, I'm going to leave that to Achig to see if you can deal with that. Yeah, so um, the, uh, this um, kind of models, they use a category, a categorization, um, like different categories. So it's not, I think, it's not, um, like a continuous uh, measures, uh, but it should be um, uh, with. If uh, there, there must be a way uh, of of uh, categorizing, uh, so anything that could be um, uh, partitioned into different categories uh, could be used um, with these models. 
uh, it just depends on the way uh, how how much sense this this uh, it makes to to um, categorize uh, the pollen, and uh, for example, uh, or the bees, uh, and for example, in the case of a specialist uh, versus. Um, um, uh, um, general, generalist bee species, this is very inaccurate. Because we see a, an entire, um, like uh, different um, uh, levels of speci specialization. So this is, uh, an, I would say, an oversimplification of, of, of the true uh, gen um, uh, Specialization uh, um, 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 the um, gradient that, that we that we see in in, uh, in bees. So uh, this is partly probably uh, the reason that uh, we uh, do not see a clear result as with the pollen accessibility in our results. Okay, thank you, Achit. Um... Are there any more questions for either of today's speakers? Um, if not, oh, some, oh so you, yeah, Ruben thanks you. We all thank you. Those were two great talks, tons of data. I look forward to reading all of these papers uh, that you're working on. Uh, very important work. Um, so if there are no more questions, we all uh, will say goodbye and uh, We'll post Felipe's part of the talk, uh, sorry, uh, Achik's part of the talk soon, and then the whole talk later once um, once the relevant papers have been published. So uh, thank you for coming. And I think the next slide tells us what the next talk is, does it? Yes, so the next talk is in last Wednesday of every month, or yes, Wednesday of every month, is the speaker series uh, next month? With Dr. Jason Gibbs and Joel Gardner speaking about recent recent advances in lazy gloss and systematics phylogeny, phylogeny taxonomy and classification. So again, just like this one, please register in advance uh, using the link from the yorku.ca slash fees slash packer website to register for September. And the other talks will be up soon for registration there as well. And I was going to put a plug in for a. Another kind of BC general talk, BCon. So for those of you that may or may not be familiar, this is our annual event. Um, used to be just Southern Ontario focused in person, but then with COVID we expanded globally and it opened up to an international audience. So this year we're going to do a hybrid. So we actually are still going to have a two day event uh, streamed live. So you can join in wherever you are around the world. But if you are in Southern Ontario or want to travel to Southern Ontario, we're also have an in-person aspect on Friday, October 14th. So virtual October 13th and 14th. We encourage people also to come in person for the 14th. We'll have networking and a social type thing. Call for proposals now up on our website. Uh, it's open for like the next three weeks due to September 21st if you want to present. And the registrations will be up very soon, probably today. And then we do the September 30th. So yorku.ca slash bees, you can find it, or bcon-2022. So yes, lots of things coming up in the next couple of months. But the Thank you, Victoria. One is one. So we look forward to many more international attendees at the bcon than we've had uh, in recent years. I can't remember how many years we've been running it, probably getting up for, towards 10 now. All right. Yeah. yeah. More than 10. Oh, my God. All right. I'm too old. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Especially thank you for today's speakers for you, your great talks. Uh, as I said, I'm looking forward to reading these papers. which I'm Thank you, everyone. Looking for now. Yeah, more than welcome. Thanks, Felipe. Nice to meet you. That thank you. Great. Good to see you again. Me too. Thank you very much. Uh, bye for now. Bye. Bye.